Thank you for joining our presentation on sphenopalatine ganglion blockade and the sphenocath. My name is Dr. Wade Cooper. I'm a headache neurologist, and I've spent more than 15 years helping people with chronic headache and facial pain. I'm also a consultant and shareholder for Dolor Technologies, makers of the sphenocath. It's my pleasure today uh, to be talking to you about SBG blockade and headache and facial pain because it can be remarkably effective in the right patient. To better understand this, I just want to emphasize our role is to help people who've got really persistent headache and really persistent facial pain and give them creative options that can be very effective. And my job is to take people who've got this overactive nervous system bundle that's been firing like crazy and finding a way to get it to calm down. In order to understand better how SBG blocks can be helpful in chronic headache and facial pain, it's important to look at the basic anatomy involved with this. So we know that people who experience chronic headache have pain fibers on the lining of the brain called the meningeal nerves. And these nerves are trigeminal branches that send their pain signal down through the trigeminal nerves into the deep brain structures. And those brainstem structures send the signal up to areas of the brain like the hypothalamus, which regulates our emotional response and our environmental response to persistent pain. And our job is to take that overactive system and get it to calm down as best as we can. Now, our autonomic nervous system plays a vital role in chronic headache. Our autonomic nervous system is what regulates blood pressure and heart rate. It's what makes us not feel lightheaded when we stand up to get up and move, but it also helps coordinate sweating, it coordinates eyeball watering, tearing of the eye, nasal stuffiness. All those things are coordinated by our autonomic nervous system. We know uh, in dysautonomia, this nervous system gets disrupted, and that's where people have a mismatch of what the nervous system is supposed to be doing, and they have an overactivation of some of these features. Uh, we know this is seen in chronic headache, and we know this is seen in chronic pain syndromes. As an example, if you look at people with chronic migraine, over 80% of them describe some type of autonomic dysfunction. That includes eyelid drooping, nasal stuffiness, facial fullness, ear fullness, uh, symptoms of eyes being bloodshot or, or engorged. Those are all things that we call autonomic symptoms that we see in, in chronic headache syndromes. And in this case, in chronic migraine, four out of five people had at least one of those symptoms. And this is important because we know our autonomic nervous system helps regulate pain. So if you consider someone who hasn't slept well, or someone who has skipped meals and is now hungry, or someone who's feeling stress, or someone who's had other types of chaos affecting their environmental nervous system, which then affects the rest of their body, this is all funneled through our autonomics on its way down to the rest of our, of our nervous system structures. Which means uh, in this situation, if someone's under stress or if someone's skipped meals, it activates pain through the structures and goes through our sphenopalatine ganglion on the way up to the rest of the body. Which brings up this most important bundle, my favorite uh, piece of the nervous system, my absolute favorite ganglion in the body is the sphenopalatine ganglion. And the reason why it's so fascinating is because it houses our parasympathetic nervous system, which is blood vessel dilation and constriction to the surface of the brain, amongst other things. It also houses our sympathetic nervous system to the skull, which is our response to stressors, which is our response to an activation of adrenaline. Uh, and it also houses pain-sensitive nerve fiber of these trigeminal nerves that are participating and innervating the rest of the skull, which means that there's branches of trigeminal pain fibers through the sphenopalatine ganglion that innervate pain sensitivity behind the eyeball, pain sensitivity to the forehead, pain sensitivity to the temples. These are all areas that go in part through the sphenopalatine ganglion on the way to the rest of the body. And if you want to know where the sphenopalatine ganglion is located, it's located deep in the skull, just lateral to the nasal passages. So I've got it shown in this cartoon picture here, but I'm going to put a cadaver picture on top so you can see just how close the sphenopalatine ganglion is to our nose structures. Here in this cadaver picture, there's a blunt dissection probe that goes in the nostril, past the inferior turbinate, past the middle turbinate, and is ducking into the lateral wall of the nose where the sphenopalatine ganglion lives. Now I've got another cadaver picture to show you. This is a coronal image, meaning you're looking directly at the face, but the face has been removed. And if we focus on the nasal structures on the right side of the nose, they've left in the nasal turbinates. These are bony structures with mucous membranes wrapped around them. On the left side in this cadaver picture, they've removed the turbinates. And you can see above where the middle turbinate should be is a bowl-shaped structure called the sphenopalatine foramen. 
on average, 6.7 millimeters behind that is going to be the sphenopalatine ganglion. And if you look at this cadaver picture, you can even see filaments from the sphenopalatine ganglion that is going through that sphenopalatine foramen on the way to the rest of the nose. Now let's look a little bit more about nasal anatomy. So if you're going to do intranasal SPG blocks, you should know a bit about how the nose is organized. The first thing to know is the nasal septum. The nasal septum is the, is the connective tissue barrier between each nostril. If you go past the nasal septum, you're going to see turbinates. These are bony structures with mucous membranes wrapped around them, and there's three of them. There's the superior turbinate, the middle turbinate, and the inferior turbinate. But the one I want to focus on is our middle turbinate because that becomes our important landmark for doing intranasal SPG blocks. The reason why is because right behind the um, above and, and slightly behind the middle turbinate, is the sphenopalatine foramen. And the sphenopalatine foramen is our access point to the sphenopalatine ganglion structures. That becomes our target for intranasal SPG blocks. A bit more about that sphenopalatine foramen. Foramen, of course, means hole or opening. And so the sphenopalatine foramen is the opening between the nasal structures and where the sphenopalatine ganglion lives. It exists there because there's nerve fibers that go through the back of the nose, which coordinates nasal pain and nasal stuffiness, but it becomes an easy access point for us to do SPG blocks. It's covered by a three millimeter mucous membrane that makes a bowl-shaped structure that can collect and hold treatment medicine. Now I want to show you what the sphenocath is designed to do for an SPG block. In this diagram, we've got someone laying flat with their neck extended. The catheter is designed to go in the nostril, advance to the top of the nose above the middle turbinate. It's got an internal catheter that when you collapse the device, articulates over the head of the middle turbinate so that when you put treatment medicine through the catheter, it follows the path of least resistance to the back of the nose. And in this position, one of the lowest structures is gonna be the sphenopalatine foramen. Once you fill that with your treatment medicine, you get your desired response. That's the general content of intranasal SPG blocks. Somehow get medicine into that uh, targeted area. Now there's some old-fashioned ways of doing SPG blocks. You may be familiar with these reading through medical journals or old-fashioned textbooks. One of them is the long Q-tip approach. This is where you take a six or eight inch long Q-tip, doused in some type of numbing agent, and you slide it in the nostril. And what we were telling our residents and fellows to do is you take it as far back as you possibly can. When you think you're as far back as you can, readjust and go even further because these things have to go in really, really far. They also have to stay in the nose for 15 minutes when you're in the right place. And because the middle turbinate is a bony structure, it many times will deflect this inferiorly and medially so you don't get good contact onto the sphenopalatine foramen area. But it's still talked about in textbooks and still done in some clinics. The other way of doing these SPG blocks uh, is the long needle infrazygomatic approach. And this is where you take a very long needle under an x-ray machine, insert it underneath the cheekbone, and advance it medially all the way until you hit the bony structures of the nose, called the pterygoid plate. Once you've hit that bony structure, you have to dance the needle along until you find the opening where the sphenopalatine ganglion lives and drop your treatment medicine. A couple downsides to this. First of all, because this is all underneath the zygoma, none of this is compressible. So if you inadvertently hit a blood vessel, hit a venous plexus or something like that, there's got no way to compress this and there's a risk for a hematoma with this approach. The second thing, and probably the most important, this is really painful. This thing can hurt and this is a needle that the patient has to be awake for during the procedure and you've got to take a very long needle and keep on inserting it till you get to the right spot. Since we've adopted Sphenocath, we almost never do this type of SPG block in our practice, but it's still talked about out there. Which allows me now then to introduce the Sphenocath itself. It's a flexible device designed to go in the nose. When you collapse the device together, an articulating tip bends out at a specific angle designed to go over the head of the middle turbinate. It's flexible enough so that you won't cause mechanical trauma upon insertion. And it's got an embossed arrow on the top of it, which allows you to know which end is up when you insert the catheter. Finally, there's a lure lock on the back of the catheter, which allows any of the syringes to be attached to the back of this. The sphenocath is intended to administer medicine or fluid to the nasal cavity for treating disorders, including targeting the sphenopalatine ganglion and including targeting the sphenopalatine fossa. Contraindications for sphenocath use include actively inflamed nasal membranes, malignancy or granulomatous disease that would prohibit correct placement of the device, 
or any nasal obstruction that means you can't get there, or any active swelling or bleeding of the nose. So when I use the catheter, the only thing I do to prepare it for administration is I lube the front of it. I take a puddle of viscous lidocaine and I roll the catheter's front half of the catheter into this so that it's pre-lubed. Now this will numb on contact, but you're gonna see in just a second, this procedure is very fast and it's more acting as a lubricant than anything else. Then we're set to go. So this next uh, slide is gonna show you how to do this phenocath procedure. I'm gonna show you me actually doing this on a patient of mine. Uh, this is Heather, she's laying with her, uh, on her back with her neck extended. You'll see me enter the catheter in her nostril. I'll take it to the top of her nose, get firm resistance, pull back and collapse the device, deposit my treatment medicine, and slide the catheter out. That whole thing took 11 seconds. Uh, so let's show that one more time. We're gonna have her lay flat in her back with her neck extended. You're gonna see the catheter enter her nostril, go to the top of her nose, hit that resistance, pull back a half centimeter, collapse the device, drop our treatment medicine, and then slide the catheter out. That quick and that easy. You'll notice that she's not wincing in pain. This is generally a very well-tolerated procedure. Uh, she looks relatively comfortable for this procedure as most of our patients who have this done tend to describe it. Now back to this autonomic business. So here's a different patient of mine, and this is Rachel, and she'd had persistent right-sided pain for more than two months. She'd been to the ER three different times, had minimal relief from IV treatments of pretty much everything you can imagine, and she comes to her clinic with two months of persistent pain. Now looking at her picture, you can see she's got autonomic impact on the right side of her face. She's got an eyelid that's drooping, she's got swelling around her uh, cheek. Now this is the same exact patient 10 minutes after a sphenocath treatment. And you can see in this situation, she's got improvement of her lid ptosis, improvement of her periorbital edema, and she's smiling. And this isn't because my jokes are funny. Uh, she's smiling because her pain's gone down. She was an eight out of 10 on a visual analog scale before we did the procedure. The picture afterwards where she's feeling better, she's already down to a two out of 10, and that's in less than, that's in 10 minutes, uh, which is a pretty remarkable response for her. You don't have to always see these autonomic features for people to get well. I like this picture because it just reaffirms this concept that you're not only treating pain, but you can also improve autonomics of the body and just reaffirms this concept of SBG blocks in general. Now this effect of SBG blocks and headache has been proven several different ways. Uh, this is an article that was published way back in 2003. And these researchers use a modified nasal catheter to deposit lidocaine onto this phenopalatine foramen. And what they did is they found there was an acute response in migraine. But what's interesting is their conclusion. Their conclusion was these findings of significant benefit doing internasal SBG blocks in acute migraine was because of a combination of trigeminal pain response, but also autonomic response. It's what separates it from other treatments that are out there currently. This article won the Wolf Award in 2003, which is a research award given by the American Headache Society for impressive research that changes our understanding in the headache space. So this other article I wanna share was just recently published through the American Academy of Neurology's Clinical Practice Journal. And what they did is they surveyed headache specialists around the country. Do you do SBG blocks? If so, how do you do them? And what type of treatments do you use? And what are ones that are most likely to respond? The results from their survey showed that the sphenocath was the most commonly used device to do an SBG block with. It showed that chronic migraine was the most likely disorder to be used for an SBG block intranasally. And it showed that chronic migraine was most likely to respond, mostly because that was the more frequent uh, disorder that was chosen. They also concluded that it was very well tolerated for intranasal SBG blocks and chronic headache. So we know that SBG blocks can have a clinical autonomic effect of the body. Uh, and we know that when you do a procedure, we see people get tearing out of the eye briefly, and you can sometimes visualize their cheek flushing. And this prompted people to record temperatures of the cheek as part of an SBG block. And we found uh, that there's an average of an increase in three degrees Fahrenheit on the cheek because you're blocking the sympathetics first, leaving the parasympathetics alone, which is why you get tearing and why you get a temperature change, but only briefly from doing an SBG block. Now this was actually shown through several research publications. The one I've cited here was done at our own institution where we showed an average of 1.4 degrees uh, Celsius, which is about three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, two and a half, three degrees Fahrenheit, change of cheek temperature right after an intranasal SPG block. 
Again, the importance is just to prove an autonomic effect, not just a pain response for people when they get intranasal SVG blocks being done. So I've got uh, adverse events to talk about. There's hardly any from doing these SVG blocks. If you're using a numbing agent, commonly you can get numbness of the throat. Uh, however, um, you can also see a spike in headache, which we rarely see. And very rarely you can get some transient dizziness that we think is where the injectate, whatever medicine you're using, has gone into the eustachian tube and affected the inner ear structures. That's super rare. In my experience, less than one in 500, but important to know about as a possible adverse event. So how about some responses in people with acute headache syndromes? This is an intranasal SBG block study for people in the ER with acute migraine. And what they found was fast relief, so within 15 minutes and sustained for more than 24 hours, 70% of the people in this open label trial showed clinical response. Pre-procedure visual analog scales was 6.8 out of 10 on average before the intranasal SBG block. It went down to less than one out of 10 shortly thereafter. And overall, people's global impression of change, their impression of how effective the treatment was, was quite high. Most people citing either very good or good with intranasal SBG blocks. The other thing I wanna show you is one that was done for facial pain. And this was again in an ER setting where patients showed up with facial pain mostly from toothache. And an SPG block intranasally was compared to standard medication management. And you can see the SPG block compared favorably to the medication management for pain relief, as well as in the McGill Pain Questionnaire, which is a multi-item uh, validated pain reporting scale system. So overall, the summary here from these authors was a transitional SPG block was easy to perform, effective regardless of pain intensity, providing effective, safe, and low-cost treatment for the majority of facial pains. So I do wanna take a second to review our key things we've covered in today's presentation. The first thing is the sphenopalatine ganglion is a nerve bundle that lives just lateral, just outside the nasal structures. It coordinates autonomics to the skull and rest of the body. It also coordinates a pain response to the lining of the brain. And it's an effective target for treating people with headache and facial pain. We've learned that the middle turbinate is a landmark for intranasal SPG blocks because the sphenopalatine ganglion structures live above and lateral to this region. We know the sphenopalatine foramen is our target for intranasal SPG blocks because it's the connector between the sphenopalatine ganglion and the nasal structures. We know the autonomic nervous system plays a vital role in chronic headache and facial pain, and it can be affected by intranasal SPG blocks to get your desired response. We know cranial dysautonomia can be seen in some patients with chronic headache syndromes and can be improved after an SBG block as we've shown you in this presentation. And lastly, we know the sphenocath is a device that provides quick, easy, painless SBG blockade for those in need. Thank you for your time today.